My name is Alan Hudson from the Immuno Oncology Translational Network Data Management Resource Center. I also serve as Chair of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Before we start the seminar, I just have a few bookkeeping items to review. Questions will be responded to at the end of the presentation. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. The audience can prioritize the order of the questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Closed captioning is available. The closed captioning for today's webinar can be accessed by clicking on the live transcript option in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are also provided in the chat box. With that, I would like to turn the proceedings over to our moderator, Dr. Sarah Mazzilli. Dr. Mazzilli is an assistant professor in the section of computational biomedicine at Boston University School of Medicine, where a group studies the early events that enable pre-malignant translation to frank lung carcinoma. Dr. Mazzilli is part of the collaborative research group at BU led by Dr. Avi Spira, who is leading the establishment of lung precancer atlas as part of the Human Tumor Atlas Network, H10. In addition to co-leading the overall efforts in data management for the lung precancer atlas, Sarah's group leads the generational generation of transcriptional and imaging data for the lung cancer, lung precancer atlas. Dr. Mazzilli. Ah, well, it is my true pleasure to get to introduce Dr. Sandro Santagata today. Dr. Uh, Sandro is a clinician scientist who is not only an active diagnostic pathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston, but also an associate professor of pathology and system biology at HMS or Harvard Medical School. Sandro is part of a research team uh, and is leading a very active research group within the Laboratory of Systems Patho Pharmacology, uh, where he co-leads uh, his HTAN group where they implement new technologies and computational approaches for multiplex tissue imaging um, it, with using cancer and precancer samples uh, and trying to understand the 2D and 3D interaction. So we're super excited to hear about uh, some of the work that Sandra has been leading uh, as part of his group within the NCI HTAN project, as well as the Ludwig Cancer Research Program where their group is really trying to drive forward our understanding of the biological properties and interactions between the tumor and immune microenvironment um, that really we hope will help us identify new and, and novel spatial biomarkers to improve both cancer diagnosis, but also therapeutics uh, and potentials there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandra. I'm excited to hear your talk today. Uh, you're, mute, you're muted, Sandro. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> I should have figured this out after years of Zoom. I apologize. Uh, so anyway, uh, first of all, thanks, Sarah, for that kind introduction. And um, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak about the work that we're doing as part of the um, Harvard H10 Center as, as a larger, as a small part of the, the Human Tumor Atlas uh, Network. What I'd like to discuss today is a, a number of things. Uh, one is our, our use of multiplex, multiplex tissue imaging technologies to build precancer and cancer atlases as part of the as part of the H10, the tools, and the uh, for analysis acquisition and also dissemination of the data. Um, I, I'll talk about insights from uh, 2D and 3D uh, atlas imaging uh, that we're we're uh, acquiring through our work. I'll talk about spatial features of cancer that we're uh, uncovering and new types of metrics that we're hoping to develop and share. Uh, in addition, I'll talk about our movement towards clinical implementation of these research methods uh, as we try to impact uh, patient care. And last, um, future directions, sort of cell biology discovery in human cancer tissues is, is part of our goal. Um, so in principle, I want to give you a sketch of general themes. I'm not going to go into too much detail on any one project, but I want to give you a sense of our philosophy. And I also want to give you a sense that we're kind of into early days. We we're hoping to get to these um, uh, highly sophisticated 3D uh, digital globes of, of cancer. But, you know, we're also, it's, it's the early days, and sometimes it feels like we're developing some of the very first maps of the Earth, which are still very useful, but, uh, but you know, works in progress uh, for sure. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest, and but I do want to state that we I will speak about work that we're doing as part of an NCI SBIR grant with RareSight on the Orion method, which I'll describe uh, a little later. 
Uh, our H10 Center is based, as Sarah said, at the Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology, the LSP, uh, directed by Peter Sorga and Laura, Laura Malasevsky. Peter and I lead the uh, co-lead the H10 Center that's based at the LSP. And it's a bit of an unusual environment in that it's multi-institutional. I'm from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Department of Pathology. Uh, we have investigators from all across Boston, uh, the U.S., and, and uh, in fact, the, the world. And it's also highly multidisciplinary computationalists, software engineers, visualization experts, oncologists, pathologists all come together, learn each other's language, and take on some very difficult problems. And I'd like to acknowledge our, our funders, the NCI, as well as the Gray Foundation, Ludwig Cancer Research, and the Bridge Project for supporting us in this, uh, what we think is an ambitious endeavor. So as Sarah mentioned, I practice pathologist, pathology. Um, I, I'm on service uh, today. I'll go back to sign on some cases after this. And we use our inspectional powers to look at uh, H&E stained images and also to, uh, to use some immunohistochemistry in our daily practice. Over the last decade, the genomics revolution has really supercharged the work that we do to improve diagnoses for our patients. And it's improved diagnostic ability but it's also improved our ability to treat patients. This is an example from our work where a decade ago, we showed that every uh, papillary craniopharyngioma, a rare type of brain tumor that arises in the pituitary area, uh, all of these have BRAF V600E mutations and uh, through work of our a close colleague, Priscilla Brastianos at MGH, that all of them respond to dibrafenib and trametinib, BRAF and MEK inhibitor. So dramatic responses where you go from a tumor that's rather large, causing a lot of morbidity for the patient to one that's very small. We wanna be able to do exactly this, but for all of our patients with cancer, but as we know, genomic medicine is only able to provide this type of um, you know, powerful uh, intervention in only a small subset of our patients. So we need to get better results for our patients, so we need to understand cancer better. And if you look at the um, the Twitter uh, logo from the NCI H10, uh, no no person is an island and no tumor cell is an island. They're parts of these complicated networks. So we want to understand cancer cells within their complex ecosystem and break down their fundamental properties within tissues, not as separated from the tissues from which they arise. And that's well described in the perspective piece written three years ago and published in Cell from the H10. So how do we do this? Uh, well, to complement the genomics revolution, there's going to be an imaging revolution that's underway. And we see this as being built upon the foundation of 100 years plus of, uh, of research and investigation and clinical work by practicing and experimental pathologists that have led to millions of manuscripts in, in, that are available in PubMed. So with this foundation, where we've, uh, as a field, have discovered disease-relevant morphologies and key molecular information, uh, we're now adding on these very powerful new tools for deeply profiling uh, cancer tissues, digital pathology tools, mass spectrometry imaging done by our amazing colleague, Natalie Agar, spatial transcriptomics, and what I'll talk largely about today is antibody-based multiplexed imaging um, of, of cancer tissues. Even though these are advanced methods, uh, we use a very simple method at the LSP. Uh, it's part of a family of acyclic immunofluorescence methods uh, introduced by, uh, by Jerry Lin. It's called SISIF. It's very simple. Three antibodies are uh, applied to a tissue section, each labeled with a different fluorophore. We stain with a, with a DNA dye. We image those that slide. We photo bleach. We don't strip the antibodies. We photo and activate the signal and add new antibodies and continue with multiple cycles. So it's very simple. We stitch together those images and then go off into computational analysis. This method is great because um, it allows us to do antibody validation. Sometimes two, three, four, or five antibodies to the same target can be validated to pick the one with the best signal. It's very flexible. We can change course in the middle of an experiment. If we see something interesting, we can add new antibodies. It's relatively low cost, about $100 to $200 a slide to get to 30 or 40 plex imaging. Jerry, who's the, uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the group, sometimes breaks the 100 plex barrier, but we don't do that too often. Um, it's easy to perform. We have about 15 members of the LSP that are actively collecting data at any one time. It's uh, rather robust uh, in the language of my teenage daughter. Uh, Sisyph slays is what she would say, I, I would imagine, if she ever <laughs> knew about Sisyph. And, um, and it slays because it gives us really robust, low-cost, whole slide imaging. The challenge with this type of data, and I'm launching these videos a little belatedly, is that it's, it's a lot of information, right? So the, the group to, to, to map cells and their types and their phenotypes has had to develop a whole range of new computational and software tools, and I'll describe some of those uh, in the subsequent slides. So whole slide images 
carry a lot of information. Each tile here has four to six channels. They need to be stitched together to make this, uh, to make this very large whole slide image containing a lot of very rich, high uh, resolution information. Once we have a, uh, uh, the stitched image for a cycle, we then register across all the cycles to, to make a composite of 30 or 40 plex uh, different, uh, different antibodies. To do this, Jeremy Mullet is uh, part of the team developed Ashlar, which gets its name from Ashlar Masonry, building of stone structures, stone walls from precisely cut stones as we try to do from, from these images. And just like these stone walls, our images are pretty are pretty heavy, data heavy for that uh, for that matter. Uh, our data sets are often five to twenty uh, terabytes or plus in size, so it can be a lot of information to uh, to manage. With this type of data, we want to extract single cell uh, information, but we need some software goals. Our goals have been pretty clear from the beginning and have gradually evolved uh, as part of the Human Tumoralis Network and, and part with the, of the Data Coordinating Center uh, led by Sage and, and Ethan Srami and team. Uh, we've developed, um, including with Sarah and others uh, in the network, metadata standards. So we want to link clinical data uh, imaging data, experimental data, biospecimen data, et cetera, et cetera, together, so that when these images are shared with the world in repositories, you know a lot about them and that information is not lost. So we've developed these metadata standards, which we called MITI, uh, minimum, minimum Information for Highly uh, Multiplex Tissue Imaging. Uh, we've also had, also had to develop a, um, an image analysis pipeline, which we at the LSP call MC Micro. It uh, allows us to automate standard image processing tasks you can access this pipeline uh, from the command line or through graphical user interfaces uh, developed by our colleagues, um, Ali Creason and, 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 um, and Jeremy Gex at OHSU in Oregon. Uh, and this enables deployment across multiple imaging platforms, not just SciCIF, but a whole wide range of other ones that are used in the community. It's a modular pipeline developed in the NextFlow language where you can swap in and out different apps, different modules to perform the necessary functions to go from image all the way to uh, to image features. And we have a really wonderful research coordination team that uh, develops educational tools available um, through our tissuealice.org website uh, for documentation, tutorials, workshops, et cetera. So we're very fortunate to be able to do that. Once you have these big images, uh, what do you do with them? Well, typically you, you, you take a little snapshot and you put it in the corner of figure um, seven of your manuscript, but these postage stamps don't really do justice to the amazing data that's present uh, in these in these maps. So partly inspired by our work as pathologists, where we often do didactics at the microscope. This pathologist is training uh, other pathologists, sometimes visitors, surgeons that come to the microscope to learn uh, the seminal features of, of tumors. We want to do the same with our images. And we also believe that reproducibility of data requires this liberation into the uh, into the world of the images. So also inspired by um, uh, tour guides in museums and let's say in the Dali Museum here or uh, audio guides that you can also have or even digital docents that are available online. We, we were inspired by this to do this something similar for our images. You can follow the, the tour guide with this H10 flag. Um, and what we do is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we uh, allow individuals to walk through the images through a guided tour with, with a table of contents and waypoints that are available. You can either walk through the tour or wander off and, uh, and self-explore with these images as, as this person in this video is doing, clicking through the various channels and inspecting the images, zooming and panning around to find important features. They can re-engage with the tour, uh, listen to what we say either through audio or just reading the text and click through the di different data types. So it's really kind of a neat way to engage with the data, much better than the postage stamps typical of manuscripts. And you can go to this tiny URL uh, to engage with this tour, but we have very we have many of these available. And we've described this through our, um, our manuscript in Nature Biomedical Engineering, describing the Minerva authoring tool, which allows you to author your own story. You can do this for your own images and then deploy those in Minerva story. These, type of, these types of images are being made available through the, uh, the H10 data portal increasingly uh, through the efforts of Synapse, Cancer Data Service, and Imaging Data Commons, as well as Severn Bridges Genomics. And we're, uh, as a work in progress, we're working with uh, Eno De Bruyne, uh, Nikki Schultz, Ethan Cerami, and team to integrate Minerva-type stories into CBio portal as well, so that there are multiple ways of accessing this type of data. So what are we starting to learn from these images? Um, and I'll, even though we have a precancer atlas of melanoma, I'll actually focus on some of our work uh, for the beginning part here in colorectal cancer. 
So Jerry Lin, uh, Xu Wang, and Shannon Coy uh, undertook a lot of the heavy lifting of this project. And what we did is we took a we took serial sections through a colorectal cancer specimen. We did an H and E stain, a classic histology stain, on every fifth section, and then the neighboring section, every fifth section, we would do cyclic immunofluorescence of 24 plex, including tumor intrinsic and immune markers to mark, to mark those cell populations and we generated single cell maps. And then we interleaved these together and registered them to generate a 3D, a first generation, uh, perhaps somewhat crude 3D reconstruction uh, of this colorectal cancer specimen. Because we think pathology annotations are important, um, we, we went through, Shannon very diligently went through and annotated each of the key ROIs, these classic histotypes as we call them. And, uh, and each of these contain critical information, normal tissue, solid areas of tumor, mucinous regions, uh, more glandular regions, to try to learn more about those disease uh, morphologies. We then trained a KNN classifier guided by these ROIs, these regions of interest of classic histotypes. And we trained a KNN classifier based on cyclic immunofluorescence data, independent of the position of the cells or their morphologies, just the, the median intensity per cell of that data. And then we use that classifier to predict other regions of the tumor that might have similar molecular properties. And what it returned is that the we were able to actually identify very robustly normal areas of, of the specimen, areas that had glandular morphology, solid morphology, and mucinous morphology. So that was pretty cool because that basically told us that disease relevant um, morphologies are encoded in hyperdimensional marker space, that there's a link, a strong link between morphology and molecular features. So we can start to tease apart what those links are. But we also noticed that some regions of the tumor uh, were not, were poorly predicted. And when we looked at those, uh, we noticed that in morphology space in H&E world, they represented areas of molecular, of, well, actually of histological transitions from normal to glandular, from mucinous to solid, from glandular to solid. So these were areas of transition that were being poorly predicted. And morphologically, they were transitioning, but they were also transitions that were occurring in molecular space between various markers, proliferative markers and, and, uh, and epithelial markers, various intermediate filling Filaments, filaments were transitioning as well as epigenetic markers. So that was kind of neat because we were able to capture this plasticity that was occurring within the tumor and these transitions, which we think are really important for understanding tumor progression and the development of therapy resistance. And now that we can measure these, we can start to understand the causes of these types of, of, of this type of transitioning plasticity, whether it's driven mostly by or mostly or partly by genetics by the environment or, you know, or perhaps by chance. So this is an area of active investigation. But we're particularly interested in how profound some of these molecular gradients are. They're not just random occasional. There's, they're, I mean, maybe they're random, they're just about everywhere. So it's rather remarkable. So if you look at, 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 at P53, a tumor suppressor expression or EGFR, for instance, you can see that there's a lot of diversity in these specimens, both with short range gradients, long range gradients, and also regions of distinct diversity. Um, in addition, if this is not just true of these markers, but you know, if you look at uh, epigenetic markers of, of uh, transcriptional suppression or transcriptional uh, activation, we also, again, we see pretty profound gradients. So there's a lot to be learned here. And conceptually, we're starting to consider these as being akin to the um, to the developing gradients in, in developing organisms. We think that there, there's an analogy to be explored there and we're actively investigating that. But very critically, we think that there are really important practical considerations as you're building atlases that relate to, to tissue sampling. So. I put these in red because I think they're very important that adequate, adequate tissue sampling is very important. And this motivates in our center the need for whole slide imaging in many, many cases. The, the central limit theorem of correlated data, it basically is telling you that effective sample size, the, the, the actual true number of independent measurements that you're making in spatially correlated data is often 100 to 1,000 fold smaller than the end that you're measuring. So for instance, if you're measuring this core over here, and, and I just want to point out that these holes here represent tissue microarray cores that are typically used so that you can expand the, the sample number of, of, your, of your study. Tissue microarray cores, let's say this one contains 1,000 cells. Effectively, you might only be measuring true independent measurements of 10 to maybe even down to one cell per core. So it's very important that statistically you account for this when, you're make, when people are making conclusions um, for about, let's say, patient outcomes. So you can imagine that if you were to sample these two cores, you'd have an EGFR low 
P53 high tumor, whereas these cores here would give you an EGFR high P53 low tumor. So you cannot easily qualitatively understand why that might lead to spurious results uh, in, in outcome analyses. And obviously this is going to apply similarly to spatial transcriptomic data, et cetera, et cetera. So caveat mTOR, some, some features can, be, can clearly be uh, measured using cores and small ROIs and others truly cannot. So back to the idea of pathology guided annotation and investigation. Looking at the colorectal cancer specimen uh, that I mentioned before, if we go to invasive margin A, we notice a really distinct histotype uh, uh, that's of, of very high importance in diagnostics, which is tumor budding. In this area here, we see individual cancer cells that are percolating, invading into the stroma, which is the classic definition of tumor buds. And, and when, when we see this diagnostically, this is associated with higher risk of metastasis and poorer survival for patients. When we look at the sample single cell, single cell RNA sequencing data from this very same sample, we cannot uh, find these cells readily. Uh, you can find them though by H&E, uh, using your, your pathology friend, or uh, also by uh, cyclic immunofluorescence. These cells are marked by keratin here in white, and you can see individual cells and up to three or four cells, which is the classic definition of a tumor bud. When we go to our 3D reconstruction and we look at these buds, however, they're not actually buds. They're indeed uh, fingers, these projections, these, these finger-like tendril pro projections that are coming off the tumor mass and extending into the stroma. So while they appear to be separated in two dimensions, in three dimensions, they're interconnected. And then when we follow the uh, molecular profile of the, of, particularly of proliferation, for instance, of these finger-like projections from their tips, all the way back into the tumor mass, what we notice is that there's a gradient. Uh, at the tips, there's a very low proliferation. And as you go back further and further into the mass and the clusters become bigger and bigger, the, the rate of proliferation, proliferation goes up. And this is not just true at, the, at this invasive stroma, uh, at, this, at this invasive margin, but it's actually true throughout this tumor and other tumors that don't even have stroma. There's a strong link between the cluster size and the, the rate of proliferation with larger clusters being um, more proliferative. So what else can we start to see that might be interconnected in this one sample? So if we look at the invasive margin B, and we look at these areas that are full of mucin, we call these mucin pools. They look like separated individual um, um, bins, uh, foci of, of mucin, where it's an extracellular substance that's, that's, uh, that pools uh, within, within the margin and also throughout the various areas of the tumor. And within those pools, you can actually see tumor uh, floating within, uh, within them, almost separated. They look separated from each other uh, in, in a two-dimensional section. When we do a reconstruction of this in 3D, however, it's really rather remarkable. These pools are not really individual pools, but they're a very complex um, mucin, they're like mucin caverns essentially that extend from all the way at the invasive front here, invasive margin B, as you can see here, all the way to the, to the lumen. You can actually find the portal. You can, it's almost like spelunking. You can go into the cave and, and make your way to the, to the front. And on the way to the invasive front, you run into these uh, floating tumor islands, but they're not really floating. They're actually like the finger-like projections at invasive margin A. Instead of being tumor buds or, or tendrils, these are different types of tendrils that are sticking out into the mucin caves and have very similar molecular properties we find to the buds that are invading into the margin. So there's a lot of really interesting perspective that this type of work is, is, um, is opening for us. And the last interconnected structure relates to tertiary lymphoid structures. These are aggregates, rather large aggregates of T and B cells that are found typically through in, in a number of cancers associated with good outcome in, in, in patients and also associated with, with response to immunotherapy. If we map these uh, by histology in each of the uh, 22 H&Es uh, and, and 25 SISIF sections, we can find a, 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 quite a lot of these TLSs. In fact, 900 distinct uh, TLSs and secondary lymphoid organs were identified in, in each of these sections. When we map them all together, though, in three-dimensional space, they're actually, most of them are not separate from each other. They're, they're actually parts of tertiary lymphoid structure networks, TLNs maybe, perhaps. We have to figure out a way to call them. And each network has its own distinct uh, kind of properties. So the ones that are in the tumor tended to have more suppressive uh, regulatory T cells. 
and the ones at the margin were, were also uh, compositionally uh, different from, from one another. And we even see gradients within these uh, tertiary lymphoid networks with certain properties at the, at, at the border uh, with the invasive tumor and different properties at the opposite face. So there's a lot going on in 2D and 3D for us to measure, and this is starting to change our perspective. And clearly, you'd imagine when you start to see the world in, in new dimensions, uh, it evokes many new questions for us and, uh, and challenges some of our preconceived notions about cancer. So in this regard, uh, we feel like we're making a, a lot of interesting progress. So what additional spatial features of cancer are we seeing? And, uh, and I'd like to make the case that we need uh, really rigorous new metrics to measure these. And I'll give you a few examples related to uh, proliferation, which is obviously one of the, uh, the hallmarks of, of cancer. So proliferation is a dynamic process. Cells are constantly dividing. They're shifting between proliferative states and non-proliferative states, and then also into arrested states. And we have markers of each of these states, which makes... Uh, in principle, uh, we have an ability to start to probe these uh, and, and these, these phenotypes in cancer tissues. The challenge we have in pathology is, you know, anyone that has a cancer resection, their material goes into a wax block, uh, formalin fixed, paraffin embedded. So these are frozen in time and they, they sit in our archives for, uh, for decades. But you, it's hard to study a dynamic process in a fixed sample. That's pretty easy to appreciate the challenge that we have there. And the other challenge that we have, and it's pretty interesting because in cell biology, we have a very complex, intricate understanding of how cell cycle is regulated. Uh, in clinical practice and often in research, we boil all of this down to one marker. And you might say, great, you can get all this information in one marker, uh, which we call KI-67, but it's kind of a, a fraught uh, exercise. So for instance, with KI-67, we know that there are problems. There's continuous expression. For instance, this is a very dark cell. This is somewhat of a lighter cell over here, and then this cell here. So when you need to binarize this data, is this a positive cell? Is this a positive cell? And is this a positive cell? That can be challenging to do. We know that there's cell cycle bias. The reason this is continuous is that um, the KI-67 is low in G1 and very high in G2. So we can easily start to miss cells that are in different phases of the cell cycle. It's also hard because when we're scoring this, I can tell you that this clearly is a tumor cell, but is this one over here a tumor cell? It's probably a lymphocyte. Is this over here a tumor cell? Probably a fibroblast, et cetera. So you can see the challenge of trying to uh, understand cell proliferation in cancer using a single marker. So it's difficult to score and leads to rather um, weak prognostic value. So Giorgio Gallia and uh, Sharkabrazi, Dai Ramos and Yang Dai, they took on this challenge of trying to understand proliferation in cancer tissues uh, with a little bit more uh, of a robust set of metrics. Giorgio now uh, is a principal scientist at Sanofi and uh, Sherar is, is on his way this summer to start his lab at Roswell Park. So they developed a five marker um, multivariate proliferative index containing KI-67, our classic marker, as well as PCNA and MCM2, additional proliferation markers. When a cell was positive for any one of these, we scored it as proliferative plus one here in green. When a cell had uh, high levels of P21 or P27, we would score those cells as, uh, as arrested, negative one here in red. And when either one of those sets of markers were missing, we would score these as, as non-proliferative. So we feel that we're, we're able to capture proliferation, non-proliferation and arrested cells better. In addition, we can use lineage markers, uh, CD45 to remove immune cells from the analysis. Uh, stromal markers to, to remove stromal cells and focus in on the, on the tumor cell population using markers like cytokeratin and e uh, We feel that these, we show that these overcome cell cycle bias by combining the markers. So for instance, these, these KI-67 negative cells are captured by PCNA and MCM2, and they express other markers of cell cycle indicating to us that they're proliferative. Uh, these cells here have P21 and P27, indicating that they're likely to be arrested, and then we can better discriminate the non-proliferative population uh, by the absence of both sets of markers. And we go on to show in, in this manuscript that uh, there's increased clinical sensitivity, that this set of metrics performs better than KI-67 
uh, alone. We can then map these phenotypes back onto the cancer tissues and start to look at the, the spatial architecture of proliferation and non-proliferation in, in, in tumor tissues. And what you can notice even just from a, a bird's eye view uh, here is that there's not a random distribution of the plus one proliferative state and the zero non-proliferative state. There's actually clusters and you can zoom in a little bit better here and see that these are these are ranging in often in, in millimeter size areas. So that, that to us is, is pretty exciting that there are these long range domains of proliferation and non-proliferation. And it's reminiscent of findings from our, our close colleague, Judith Gudo at Dana-Farber, who's recently shown that uh, tumor cells, when they resist T cell attack in, in, in mouse models, uh, through, through the introduction of adoptive T cell therapy, they form these quiescent cancer cell clusters and that are also immunosuppressive. So we think that these regions here are very likely the QCCs that Judith and her team and Pilar Baldominos and others and her group are seeing in, in mouse models. And in fact, when we look at human tissues, we can see that after therapy, these domains expand. So we're working closely with Judith to try to understand this spatial architecture of cancer a little bit better. But there's another spatial range, uh, a short range architecture that also needs to be appreciated. So if you look at higher power in this region too, and it's mapped here by these dots in green, which are proliferative, uh, blue non-proliferative and red uh, arrested, you can see that there's also a clustering of cells uh, even at the local, at local architecture. And if we look at the spatial correlation of uh, of cells that are proliferative plus one with the immune cells, we notice that they're actually very uh, tightly linked with, um, with certain T cell populations in breast cancer and other tumor types. So, so immune uh, tumor cells that are proliferating are being surveyed very closely spatially by, uh, by, by, by cytotoxic T cells. And in ovarian cancer, we see that it's cytotoxic T cells as well as helper T cells. So we have this interesting uh, microstructure to the proliferative environment. And this has been seen also by our, our other close colleague, Anina Farkala, who's now at the University of Helsinki. She's seen this, uh, this, this connection, uh, this spatial orientation and, and arrangement uh, in ovarian cancer as well, and shown that this, that this immune, immune uh, surveillance is increased in BRCA mutant um, uh, uh, ovarian cancer. So, so we're now all very interested in what's, what's shaping the proliferative architecture of cancer, these long range and short range domains, are these involved in the mechanisms of resistance, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of excitement for us in this field. Now, we're trying to build metrics that tell us a lot about tumor tissues. So it's focusing on proliferation. We don't wanna just know whether cells are proliferating, but we wanna see if we can extract information about cell cycle dynamics. And I won't go into a lot of detail on this. Um, I'll just give you a very, very brief overview. And I refer you to our, our manuscript in Nature Cell Bio from last year. But we know that we can separate out arrested cells and proliferative cells and then start to look at cell cycle dynamics, specifically in the proliferative MPI plus one population, using a range of markers, eight to 10 cell cycle markers that, that cover the various transitions in the cell cycle. Um, we, you know, we, we would stain these and we'd see these really beautiful images and we would struggle really to understand uh, what is the best way to represent this information that captures cell cycle dynamics. So Georgia and Shriar developed a, a really interesting new approach where they looked at the, the, um, the correlation of the markers in high dimensional space. I will spare you the details just for the sake of brevity, but we can take the, that, that correlative structure in high dimensional space. You can imagine that G1 markers would be, would be correlated because they'd be simultaneously similarly expressed at similar levels. Then you'd have transitions into G2. We would take that highly correlated data projected down into two dimensions, as you can see here, and it forms this interesting torus shape, we could find the beginning of the cell cycle and do pseudo time analyses by mapping each of the cells to the to the timeline. So we can start at the at the beginning of the cell cycle and go all the way through the, the entire cell cycle. And then, you know, in certain samples, we'd see this beautiful torus that looks just like the cells in cell culture. In other samples, though, we'd see cells piling up in G1. That could either be because they're starting to arrest in G1 or because they're going through G2 very quickly, and most of the cells are present in G1. In other samples, we'd see the opposite, where the cells, there would be very few cells in G1, and most of the cells would be in G2. And in other cells, we would see a lack of correlation altogether and a piling up of cells in the middle. So by using the circle uh, fit here, we can measure the distance of cells from, from the circle fit. Either they're on the circle, which we think represents strong proliferation, or they're off the circle, which we call non-coherent dynamics. 
We could also measure how distributed the cells are across the torus, whether they're in whether there's a, a, a increased variation and they're piling up in one phase of the cell cycle or whether they're evenly distributed. So those are the kind of metrics that we're starting to develop. Giorgio and uh, and Megan Berger teamed up on a on a separate project looking at the lymphocyte architecture of tumors. And this manuscript was just accepted yesterday at Cancer Cell, so very exciting for, for us and for, for them. Megan um, is part of, was part of the JAX lab, and now she started her own group at OHSU, so very excited for her. And in this study, we look at the spatial architecture of immune networks. So I showed you before these very large tertiary lymphoid structures. In fact, in cancers, that represents a minority of the, of the organization of, of the lymphocyte environment. There are actually many substructures of interconnected lymphocytes, which we can see down to a few cells uh, four or five, six cells interacting with each other up to hundreds of cells. And we, we in this study, we map the, the, um, the spatial properties of, uh, of, these, of these lymphocyte networks, their compositional properties, and their role in response to immunotherapy, vaccines, as well as checkpoint, and, and how they respond and change with the introduction of antigens. So there's a lot of metrics that we're really trying to push that we think are important. So we call these lymphocyte networks lymph nets, and we're starting to investigate them uh, in a little bit more detail. And lastly, in terms of metrics, we're also interested in, in a whole range of other uh, interactions, not just uh, tumor cell phenomena, not just lymphocyte phenomena, but the interactions of tumor and immune cells. And in one system, which is uh, adenosine signaling, it's an immunosuppressive mechanism that uh, seems to be very common in tumors where extracellular uh, ATP is broken down by an ectoenzyme, CD39. It breaks down into ADP and AMP uh, due to the properties, the enzymatic properties of CD39. And then the AMP is converted into adenosine, which is, has, has a whole range of different functions and is, is highly immunosuppressive. In work by Shannon Coy, we show that CD39 is expressed largely by microglia in, in gliomas, in, G, in glioblastoma and in pediatric uh, pontine gliomas. Uh, CD39 by the microglia, um, the microglia then come into close proximity of the tumor cells, which express CD73. And we show that these are spatially correlated, highly spatially correlated, not randomly distributed in the tumor environment. And this spatial correlation, we think, is contributing to the, into the production of, uh, of adenosine from ATP. Again, another way to start to look at tumor immune interactions. So in the next section, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit of how we're moving towards clinical implementation. And looking at that, we, we, we basically, um, you know, the research tools that we're using are not, not quite compatible with the clinical workflow. So we wanted to, to come up with some very basic first principles. We thought that we're going to need whole slide imaging. That's an FDA requirement. And it's also important to achieve statistical power, as I showed before with those TMA cores. Um, there, we need sufficient plex to investigate various parts of the biology, both tumor biology, immune phenotyping, and some pharmacodynamic measures. So we think that's roughly in the 16 to 18 marker range. Sometimes you'll need a few less. Maybe you might need four, five, six markers for some, for some applications, and others you might need a few more. We think it's very important to have same slide immunofluorescence and H&E. So this will support the integration of histopathology interpretation and molecular data together uh, uh, in, in these analyses, subcellular resolution to permit segmentation and, and, and computation, and simplicity of workflow just because clinical labs need, need robust workflows that are, that are simple and not the cyclic methods that we do in the laboratory. So for this, we we uh, we've worked with with uh, with RareSite uh, through an SBIR an NCI SBR IR mechanism on the Orion method. This is a method for um, applying multiple antibodies. In this example, 16 to 18 antibodies that each are conjugated to a different fluorophore. We apply these to FFPE tissues, imaging using some some nifty engineering uh, with multiple lasers and tunable emission filters to extract the individual signals from the different antibodies. We then take the slide. Uh, do uh, put it on an auto stainer for H and E, and then we get the H and E images. And a, a composite view of this shows you just a few of the markers that we have uh, here in immunofluorescence and the 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 same section H and E. And this is a blow up version of of the um, of using Minerva, where you can see that it's same same section, and you can zoom between H and E and go back to IF. So it's kind of neat to go between to the two in the same space. There's a lot of information available to us 
in the autofluorescence channel as well. A lot of structures that don't stain with antibodies are connective tissue structures, uh, such as the internal elastic lamina, as you can see here, autofluorescing, the external elastic lamina, and a lot of collagen as well. So we think there's a lot of information to extract from the autofluorescence channel. And additionally, there's quite a bit of information in, in, um, in H&E alone. Uh, we can develop um, methods to identify neutrophils. Obviously, we, we don't have markers for neutrophils in this particular panel, but these can be identified uh, on H&E, so can eosinophils, and so can various uh, phases of, of, of mitosis. So we can label cells in H&E, we can label cells in immunofluorescence, and we can now we have this ability to have convergent information. And we wanted to test uh, the value of, of, of Orion, so we applied it to um, we, we, we tested the Orion method using this immunoscore um, biomarker that's, that's very well established in the colorectal cancer field. We imaged whole slide um, uh, uh, colorectal cancer specimens, as I'll describe, and we recapitulated some of the, the, the metrics of the immunoscore. And what this is, is when, when a patient has colorectal cancer, one can, can, can assess the level of immune infiltration within the tumor using uh, CD3, a T cell marker, and CD8, a cytotoxic T cell marker, and assess the level of infiltration both in the tumor compartment and at the invasive margin. Uh, patients with low infiltration do really poorly, uh, but relatively poorly. Patients with high infiltration uh, have, um, have a, 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 better, a better prognosis. So we took our Orion data, we imaged 40 colorectal cancer specimens and started to compute uh, the immunoscore. We thought that was like a really basic first thing to try. So we, with, with Orion data, we can identify the tumor compartment as well as the tumor margin, and again, compute CD3 and CD8 levels um, for, for each of um, for those markers. And what we did was rather simple. We computed CD3 both at the tumor core and at the invasive margin, as well as CD8 at the tumor core and the invasive margin. We found samples that had low CD3, and we put we basically put the median. And if you if you were below the median, that that sample was scored as a zero. Uh, if it was above the median for that marker and that location, it was scored as a one. And then we computed this for each of the markers at the at the core and those two markers also at the invasive margin. We then added up the scores and whether if a patient had low uh, immune infiltration, a zero, one, or two. They, they, they were scored as low and, and high infiltration was scored as high and patients with low infiltration had shorter progression-free survival compared to patients with higher infiltration, which was pretty striking. And this is what the Kaplan-Meier looks like with a HR hazard ratio of about 0.21, which is, which is quite good. But because we have a lot more data, not just CD3 and CD8, we, we computed uh, a whole range of different um, uh, uh, biomarkers, we call them image feature models because they're not as well established as biomarkers, but we computed a whole range of different combinations of these markers to see which ones would have the most robust hazard ratios. IFM1, image feature model one, is our version of the, of the immunoscore, which does really well in, in terms of predicting um, um, uh, outcome. Whereas, but, but there were about a thousand more uh, combinations that performed better. And so we picked the best one, which turned out to have CD45, PDL1, and CD4 at the invasive margin and, and alpha SMA in the tumor core. And then when we look at the, the performance of this image feature model, Two IFM two, it does really well, about threefold better than than the classic immunoscore. So this shows as, as a new approach for trying to find um, very robust biomarkers. And if you look at this in in uh, in the imaging space, you can quickly see that there are lower CD four counts as opposed to here in the in the high scoring tumor where there are higher CD four counts, higher PDL one, et cetera. So it, it translates into our understanding of hot and cold tumors and and the biology of those of those tumors in um, uh, in colorectal cancer. We've taken this data, this is just one use of this data, obviously, we, we've put the data through a, a number of machine learning approaches, as well as neighborhood analyses, and we've computed even higher performing um, biomarkers, which we've been able to validate in, 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 a, in additional cohorts. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this type of approach for integrating H&E and IF, but there's a lot more that we can do with this type of data, and we're, we're proceeding boldly and, and trying to do some of that work now. And in the last few slides, I just want to give you a sense of the direction that we're hoping to go in terms of studying cell biology processes in human as well as mouse uh, tissues. 
and, and you can get a sense of, of what I've described already. There's three dimensions, there are two dimensions, there's large scale areas, and then there's higher resolution areas. So there's a lot that one can do and you need to tune your approach based upon your particular question. And uh, I apologize for all the flashiness of this, but it's, it's just kind of intended to give you a sense of the broad overview that you can have of a tumor, and then you can zoom into a particular um, area of interest. In this case, this is a uh, pre-melanoma, an area where there's uh, immune uh, regression, where the tumor, where the immune system is attacking the tumor cells. So you can see that here where a T cell has polarization of CD8 at this immunological synapse. In red is the tumor cell. So that you can actually see this engagement of the T cell with the tumor cell forming what we think is a, is, a, is a marker of functional contact. Again, polarizations occurring here, CD8 at this immunological synapse with the, with the tumor cell. And then interestingly, as we zoom around to the backside here, away from the immunological synapse, you see uh, polarization of TIM3 and LAG3, which are, which are inhibitory molecules. So there's a lot of morphological information, not just the proximity of the cells to, relative to one another, but the actual information within cells that we're really eager to start to extract. We can measure these. We can put a line through this, that, that tumor cell and immune cell that we saw before and measure the distribution of markers uh, along that T cell. So at the, at the far margin, they're very low CD8, but at the, at the junction, there's very high CD8 as shown here. So we can, we can measure this rather clearly. You can see polarization uh, also very clearly here in, in ovarian cancer where the macrophage has pdl one polarized to the T cell. Uh, engaging this and showing that there's functional interaction and inhibition. And you might wonder, well, why don't you just tell me about the proximity of the cells to one another? For instance, here there's a CD8 cell and here there's a tumor cell. But there's this character over here, which is the macrophage, which is extending a long process across to inhibit that T cell. And you can see that when we make when we do three-dimensional optical sectioning through the cell, this long arm is extending across and engaging. Uh, there's a receptor ligand interaction here of PDL1 and PD1. Uh, that you can see in, the, in this video as well. So the proximity of the cells relative to one another is alone not sufficient to tell you about function. There's a lot of, of, of contacts that are occurring over long distances. Sometimes with macrophages, it, these are multivalent interactions. We're interested in the, the shapes of cells. There's a lot of nuclear atypia that occurs early in cancer and later in cancer. And to measure these, we really need to start developing better tools for imaging. So one of the one of the one of the things that we're doing now is instead of looking at five micron thick sections, as you can see here, where individual nuclei are basically spliced apart and you only get a glimpse of a part of a cell, we're doing a lot of thicker section multiplex imaging where you can get the entire profile of a cell to get a sense of their shape, the size, and then to link the molecular markers. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, from, a melan from these melanocytes with arborization. This is a normal melanocyte. We can actually extract individual melanocytes and, from their images and, and tell you about their shape and their sizes and compare those to neighboring melanoma cells. And in the last slide, I also want to show you that we also want to push deeper and deeper into cells. So here we're looking at glioblastoma and we're looking at two cells, cell one and cell two. We're looking at micronuclei within these using super resolution multiplexing with SciSIF. This cell here has a ruptured uh, micronucleus. These structures are unstable. That leads to sea gas and sting activation, whereas the neighboring cell has an intact micronucleus and does not. So really trying to push more into the cell biology principles of, of cancer. So I wanted to give you this tour of, of our world where you know, we're still very early days. The maps are in progress. We're de um, developing tools supercharged by, by the H10 uh, collaborations and, uh, and our work at the LSP. We're coming up with a lot of new perspectives about cancer in terms of links between morphology features and molecular features and these transitions, interconnectedness of structures in terms of the buds, pools, and TLSs, the proliferative architecture of cancer, the need for new metrics, the integration of H&E and IF in clinical practice, and also these cell biology tools where we're hoping to get higher and higher resolution. Uh, we think that now in the clinical world, we can actually measure um, samples with more precision and provide more value for research studies as we move between cell culture, mouse, and human studies. So we think there's a lot of value there. And I want to close with the, 
the appeal that tissue imaging is going to be highly synergistic when computation and pathology work closely together. Uh, pathology is such an important part of this field uh, because of all the hundred plus years of information. So I think the two working together are going to lead to some pretty impressive um, results. I want to thank our, our team and our collaborators in, in the LSP in Boston, but across the H10 and the LSP, of course, the, the nucleus here that's represented by the double layered membrane here of Peter, Laura, uh, Elise Chen, and, and Kate Luria. Uh, we're really grateful for everything that they do. I want to thank you, thank the patients, and, uh, and thank you for the trust that they place in us in, in all the research that we do. Anyhow, thank you. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Sandro. So much exciting information. And so we do have some questions kind of coming in through the um, Q&A and just encourage people to continue to both add more questions and thumbs up those that you think are important for us to address. And so we'll start with one of the questions, really trying to bring two components of your talk together around the TLS or TLN, the, the networks uh, that you identified and the kind of quiescent proliferative component of your talk and a question around whether or not those are related. Is there some, you know, interesting findings that you're finding between the two? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's a it's a great question. And the, the beauty of this data, it's kind of like genomic data where you collect it and the reason to disseminate it through the data portal of the H10 and through our various sites is that you can't ask all the questions yourself, right? So, so we've never asked that particular question of the relationship of proliferative uh, domains with TLSs and we should. So it's a great question. And um, we do know that, that the, 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 um, the QCCs are um, non-proliferative, the, 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 the areas that Judith has identified and we think are analogous to what we see in human are quiescent. We know that they're immunosuppressive. We just don't, we haven't yet mapped the, the proximity of lymph nets even or, um, or TLSs to those structures, and we certainly should. Awesome. And then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll intersperse some technical questions along with, you know, some of these more scientific. And so those 3D images are, are just so impressive. And so a question is about kind of how do you create those? Is there a certain thickness, you know, so many sections of a tissue that you really need to have in order, in order to start to think about how to use computation to yeah. really identify them? Um, excuse me. Yeah. So that, those are, that's another really interesting question. Um, we do 3D in two types, as I showed at the end, this sort of thick section 3D. There's actually a lot of 3D information in a five micron thick section. So with high resolution imaging and optical sectioning, you can get really interesting 3D in five microns up to 20 or even 40 micron thick sections can sit effectively on a slide. The other ones, we we, we register them. We, we basically, um, we do individual images and we register those together. There are newer techniques with light sheet that are, that are on the way, but some challenges with, with effectively multiplexing using those technologies that need to be resolved. Um, to, to, to start these proof of principle studies, we just we just image serial sections uh, because SciCIF is pretty high throughput. We could do 25 plus sections pretty efficiently and then stitch them together with registration and and various you know various software tools to to start to explore that data. So that's that's like the technical foundation, and we have a lot of that in the in the manuscript, uh, the the Sardana cell paper that 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 was recently published. But I'm also happy to talk with people about more of the technical details. Fantastic. And then maybe another question to go back to, you know, these two, these mucin pools, if you, if you will, one of the questions yeah. was about is, is there some specificity from the multiplex staining that suggests what's in those mucin pools? Is it specific to like MUC5AC, MUC2, or, or different mucins that maybe are more found in, in colorectal cancer? Yeah. So we haven't used multiplex tools to, to phenotype them uh, in any in any detail. So I'd, I don't know in these particular samples, but you're right, exactly those are the types of mucins that are that are present. Um, we do think that that they provide a an immunosuppressive environment. So around those regions, there's they're deeper into the tumor, they tend to be immune cold. Uh, so so there, there might be a way a mechanism of immune evasion for for some of these cells that are that are sort of sort of like infiltrating into those pools but um but again more work to be done excellent uh there's a question about tumor purity so you know you brought in the verse first slide you brought in kind of the what genomics and, and transcriptomics is bringing to the field and, and the imaging space you know one of the big questions we often ask is what's the tumor purity it, do you get tumor purity measures I mean I assume you can use one of the keratins or some things like that but do you use that as one of the approaches to thinking about uh, assessing your tissue yeah so so the great part about 
it is, you know, you, you can see, you can see what you're analyzing, right? So we can tell how much tumor is there. We can tell what fraction of uh, an image is tumor versus immune versus stroma. We can effectively do that pretty routinely. Sometimes in, in pathology, we, you know, we, if 5% of cells are positive for cytokeratin, I can call it a carcinoma, but in the multiplexing world, I'm going to lose 95% of those cells that are cytokeratin uh, negative. So one of the reasons to have integrated H&E and multiplexing is that you can then identify, for instance, tumor cells by H&E just by their morphology and without without the need for, let's say, a, a tumor marker in some cases, because there can be a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, so we have to contend with those those questions of purity and heterogeneity, but in, in a somewhat different way than you would in, 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 uh, in sort of more bulk genomics. That makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a question about um, kind of the difference between the primary tumors and the metastasis and whether there's a conservation between some of those relationships and structures you're seeing uh, within some of the tissues. Yeah, so, so very early days, I think, of, of those types of analyses. As you know, even, you know, getting matched samples is, can, be, can be partly uh, can be somewhat challenging from just a, a you know a clinical workflow uh, perspective. So studying those samples is important as part of our Orion uh, data set. We've done a little bit of that between primary lung cancer and METs to the brain, and there's a there's an, a large amount of rewiring of the immune system. Um, but again, early days of anal analyzing those. But I but I I think those are very important questions in terms of analyzing the immune microenvironment in each of the areas. And there's there's small there's single cell RNA sequencing studies that start to address that, but but it would be very interesting to look at the different engagement of immune cells and tumor in the different compartments. Still, still work in progress. Yeah, maybe I'll push you a little bit from my own perspective. Is you know, can you comment a little bit about how you think about that in the pre-invasive space? Or you yeah. didn't have a lot of time to talk about the pre-cancer yeah. component yeah. of your your HDM work, but you do want to speak to that as well, just to complete the spectrum. Yeah. So, so what I think is remarkable about pre-cancer and, and these tools are, they, the, the reason we, our center pushes so hard in imaging is because we, we don't have single cell RNA sequencing for pre-melanoma. We just have FFPE blocks. So we can only basically do imaging, although that's not exactly true, but imaging is really, is really strong component of, 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 of our push. Um, the, the amazing part about precancers is that you have the very earliest stages. You have normal from the same specimen next to like very early, early atypical changes to in situ cancer to pre-invasive. So in one specimen, you can study the entire progression of the lesion. And by histologic annotation, very careful, metho, you know, meticulous annotation by pathologists, um, you can really start to discriminate the molecular properties of the changes and the transitions. That's what we're doing in melanoma work. Ajit, Ajit Johnson, uh, Clarence Zoltan, Amalaga, Atulia Valilius are there. They're working very uh, diligently to understand this progression in melanoma, but we're starting to look at this in ovarian cancer, in esophagus, uh, you're doing it in lung. There's a lot of excitement that comes from this micro-regional analysis and, and um, determining the nuances of how those change as tumors progress. Thank you. Um, this is a question. I'll, I'll ask it. I don't know if you will specifically have the answer, but is there opportunities for brainstorming around these multidisciplinary discussions and biology and image processing techniques? Um, you know, not specific to the H tan or maybe a larger network yeah. that you could offer up. Yeah. Well, I think there there are a number of. Um of like hackathons that are held by the CSBC, the Cancer Systems Biology Consortium, by the H10, by, by other groups uh, in the US and in Europe to, to develop better tools. Uh, you, you, some of our tools still need a lot of work and we still don't fully know if we're analyzing the tissues in the optimal way. Um, the reason to release the data is to, is to help others um, access large volume uh, multiplex data to, to, to fine tune their tools. So, so I, a number of these are occurring and, um, and you know, I, I, I'm super excited to see what, what they come up with because we ourselves need better tools and, and, and looking forward to working with other centers to develop them, obviously. Um, and it seems like maybe we have enough time for one or two more questions. One other kind of thumbs up question that's in here is I asked the first part of it around the proliferation and the T cells, but is there a spatial relationship um, between some of these tumor clusters and extracellular matrix? It wasn't part of your talk, but maybe you have some interest in it. 
Yeah, so Clarence, who's who's really amazing, he's starting to do some second, it's the second harmonic generation, HSSG, uh, to look at uh, collagen structures. And there's a lot of changes that are occurring between in pre-invasive and invasive. That's going to be very exciting. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we just we just basically building the tools now to do that and to integrate multiplexing and additional methodologies, which might include mass spectrometry imaging in the near future, but also other uh, microscopy tools. How about one more question, Sarah? All right, one more. I, I think that this is a nice way to end it is, you know, you are a clinical pathologist and maybe more experienced in all these crazy technologies that, that some other pathologist colleagues that you have aren't. What's the future? How, how do we kind of move between this very highly multiplex to kind of stepping it down into something you use on, on a regular basis? You talked about, you know, this one system and approach and, you know, but that's at Harvard Medical School. How do we adopt this into a kind of more broad range and, and move that highly multiplex down to a kind of clinical applicable biomarker or test that can be applied? I think these studies, these these methods will be applied in clinical trials first. We'll we'll identify key biomarkers that are important for specific clinical indications. We'll then start to apply them. They might be threeplex, they might be eightplex, they might be fourteenplex. We don't quite know yet, and we'll have to tune our assays and our workflows to like accommodate those those pressing clinical needs. That's what I think is going to be very important, and I think these are going to challenge a lot of our. Uh, preconceived notions about tumor biology. And I think that's that's where a lot of the excitement is going to come and a lot of flexibility on the pathology side, on the research side, and, and conversations. I think that like the ones we're having here at the LSP, where these multidisciplinary discussions, they're absolutely essential. It sometimes feel like, it feels like the Tower of Babel, um, but we, we, we come to a common language. And I think that is really important to be in close proximity and working closely together. Well, thank you, Dr. Santagata, for an excellent talk. Thank you, Dr. Mazzilli, for excellent moderation. Just a reminder, these talks are recorded, so if you've missed anything, um, they'll, they'll go up, they'll be posted in about two weeks or so. With that, I'd like to remind everyone of our next Cancer Moonshot seminar, which will be Cell Death Induces Non-Classical Mechanisms of Therapy Resistance by Dr. Sisson Chan, and we look forward to your attendance for that as well. Thanks, everyone. That was great.